All right, good afternoon. Thank you for coming. This is Advanced Design for Engineers. And uh, really glad to have you here. Design's often broken into you know, two components, form and function, and this talk is no different. Uh, we're gonna have Christian Robinson uh, presenting on form, and he designed the Roboto typeface. And I'm gonna present on function, on interactive design. And I got to work on Google Now, which launched yesterday. So as you can imagine, I'm incredibly tired. Uh, having, you know, being engineers, you guys know how uh, launching software is and making sure everything's perfect in the end. Uh, but while I am physically incredibly tired, I am extremely excited to be able to give this talk. Uh, if I, you know, the thing I love more than actually doing interactive design is teaching it. So it's really exciting to get a room of incredibly smart people and to uh, provide all this information to you. So let's dive into interactive. So, now this is a room of engineers, I'm assuming. Uh, raise your hand if you're an engineer. Yep, okay. Uh, so often engineers don't have a tremendous amount of respect for design. And it's not that they don't think design's important. They don't, they don't you know, they realize it's critical to the su success of their application. But the reason they, they disrespect it is it's not controllable in the way that software is normally controllable in hardware. Because um, you're dealing with people. And people can be kind of random. Um, so because you can't control the people, you feel like, well, you know, I'll, I'll spend more attention on the things that I can control, the, the execution time, the amount of storage being used, if it's crashing or not, uh, if it's reproducible. And this, it's not entirely true that people aren't controllable, because really what we're fundamentally dealing with is two information processing machines. And um, that's, of course, you know, the CPU and the brain. And, you know, the, in some ways they're very similar. Um, they're both doing computation. Uh, you know, one parallel processing, the other one massively parallel. Uh, one's base two, the other one's based on action potential, so you have dramatically more computational power. But where they start to be different is um, we know exactly how computers work. Uh, we can go back and talk to a lot of the people that were kind of instrumental in the field. Uh, it hasn't been that long. Um, so computer scientists, you know, they, they've, there's things they're still discovering about how to make things efficient, but it's not like there's any part of the machine we don't understand yet. Whereas if you talk to, you know, someone doing neuroscience or cognitive science, you say, how does the brain work? they have to kind of shrug and say, you know, we're, we're still trying to figure that out. And that's okay. Like, we don't have to have a complete knowledge of how the brain works to still have predictable results. There's enough that we understand about it that we can rely on to get those predictable results. So for the purpose of this talk, uh, it's really kind of dehumanizing, where we're gonna treat uh, people like information processing machines. And you might think, well, no, I'm a special snowflake. And yes, you are. Um, but you're also, for the purpose of this talk, a you know, uniform snow processing machine. So three uh, aspects of a great interface. First, it needs to be self-describing. Secondly, you need to prevent errors. And then third, make users fast. So we're gonna dive into each of these. So starting out, self-describing. The first thing I wanna talk about is this notion of mental model. And a mental model is basically, it's a simulation of reality inside of your mind. So to pose a question, you know, how many instances of this talk are happening right now? And of course, you know, the answer is one. There's, it's right there. The photons are bouncing off the screen at you. And you know, when you're in a big room, you know, you got the talk there, and that's, that's reality. But then on another side, you have the fact that everyone is interpreting the talk in a simulation of the room inside their own head. So you have, you know, all these simulations going on. And these are the mental models they're building of the reality around them. So I mean, this is a very sort of, you know, dystopian movie. Maybe we're all in our little pods and we don't know it. Um, but what's important about this is when you're dealing with interface design, you're not necessarily designing reality as much as you're designing the simulation. You're designing how people are going to think about your application and how they're gonna interpret it and if they're going to understand things. So, you know, looking at this just in terms of, you know, a quick diagram, you have the implementation, which of course you're incredibly familiar with. Then you have the interface, uh, which is how that implementation manifests itself. But what's really important is the mental model, the simulation of the interface inside the user's head. This is something Alan Cooper writes a lot about in his early work. And of course you have this fourth component, which is the manual. And often uh, uh, the manual likes to take the blame. Uh, you know, in email lists or talking to engineers, it's not uncommon to run into, you know, read the fracking manual as kind of the, the explanation of why this doesn't work. And just passing the, uh, the blame forward, if you don't want to blame the manual, you know, you can always blame the users, uh, which, you know, maybe they, Maybe they're stupid, maybe they didn't get it. Like, that, that's why it failed. And I would argue that it's really not about the intelligence of the user. So to quickly make that argument, let's say we take four geniuses. Um, we'll just select, you know, Einstein, Turing, Eric Schmidt, and you. 
And um, we're going to run a lot of experiments, so we're going to need clones. Um, so we start cloning all these guys. And we put them in our deep underground layer. And now clones are really expensive. So we're going to have to keep them safe. So we're going to put them in a room like this. And the rooms, uh, you know, it's to protect them because clones are expensive. But it's also to protect them from any external information. We want to have total control over this experiment, right? So every day we bring them into a testing chamber. Looks like this. And we start to teach them. We start to teach them about the world. Uh, we go over you know, various, various things like you know, traffic lights, you know, common things that people are going to encounter, maybe turtles. Um, you, know, you get the general idea. right? And then once we've got that baseline knowledge of what we expect them to have encountered in the world, like we're not going over any you know, theoretical physics or anything, like just baseline knowledge, then we start running our experiments. And here's where it gets fun. So we show them you know, a screenshot, and we say, Okay, hey, looking at this, this thing you've never seen before, what does that button do? And can they get it? Can they get it right? Even though they don't have access to anything other than what they're seeing right here. And they're you know, starting to think, well, you know, the, the curvature is very similar to the arc of the thing that's next to it. It's visually lighter, so it feels like it's sort of not there like the other thing is there. Um, there's only one of these, and it's just the side. So you know, they, they might not know for sure, but they might start to guess. I bet it creates another one. Just the way that it's shaped, the way that it's placed, conveys those types of things. Or another example, this one harder. We say, OK, what does HTTPS stand for? And there's no way they're going to get this right, because you know, we didn't tell them. right? It's, it's jargon. It's, it's, a, um, you know, it's, it's an acronym they're not going to get. But it's green. We did teach them about traffic lights. Uh, and it's next to a lock, a metaphor. Um, so even if they don't get it totally right, its sort of placement and the various things that it conveys, then they might get close enough to say, well, it you know, probably means that this is better somehow. Um, so they're able to bootstrap conceptually just up enough. Or another example, um, this one more visual. And we bring them in and we say, what does this application do? And they're going to say, it's very pretty. Uh, and then they're going to say, I don't know. Because uh, while this icon is pretty, also I think, did you work on this one? Not Aaron? me. One of, right. For the designer in the room who worked on this, I'm sorry, it's a great icon. Uh, but it does, not, <laughs> it does not convey to the user in this test chamber with access to no other knowledge what it actually does. Um, it is a great application, though. It, it's shipped on all the devices that you guys have. I should check it out. I use it every day. Uh, this is Currents. Um, so you know, what, is, what does this app do? Uh, they're not going to know. So I would argue that success in these situations, it doesn't have to do with their intelligence. It has to do with access to information. Is that information embodied in the thing that they're using? So you know, quickly you're thinking, all right, well, you know, what if I don't have this you know, underground testing facility? That sounds really expensive. And uh, it's true. And this is controversial. Uh, it's especially controversial for any user researchers in the room. But I would argue, uh, or user researchers watching later, uh, I'd argue, like, while it's really, really useful to have access to user researchers, you don't absolutely have to rely on them. You, you could just start running user tests in your own head. Uh, basically a short-term amnesia. Um, what you have to do is you have to kind of encapsulate your mind. You have to start thinking, you know, forgetting the things that you know about your interface. Try to look at it with fresh eyes. Try to think, okay, I've never seen this thing before, which is hard because you have seen it before. Um, really, really hard. But if you can do that, if you can look at it with fresh eyes and try to have all of the assumptions fall away that you've already built up, then you're able to do that kind of user test just on yourself quickly right then. And if you're just regularly doing that, it's going to really improve your applications. I think this is one of the most important things that I can convey. But you know, obviously, you're going to be more familiar with the underlying implementation because you are literally building it. In the case of a clock, you are probably intimately familiar with each of the gears and how they fit together and all these details. But you have to just let that fade away. You have to think about, OK, just the interface. Is the interface conveying the right things? And then beyond the interface, the mental model. How is the user simulating this in their head? What information are they getting out of it? So you know, back to the diagram, letting that implementation fade away. So that's self-describing, um, at least. That's talking about if something should be self-describing. But how do you pull that off? Um, you know, it's one thing to say it's important. It's another thing to tell you literally how to do it. So there's at least five ways. Uh, the first one is consistency. And this is cheating, um, basically. It works great. but uh, it's also kind of a tautology to say, hey, if I design something just like uh, things that the user already knows, they're going to know how to use it. That is true. 
Um, you do not have to rely on this entirely, though. In fact, Google products are often very different from what's already in the marketplace, and they still are able to bootstrap knowledge from users and have them figure it out. I mean, in the case of Gmail, it was sort of a radical reimagination of how email interfaces worked, but it still worked. So, and also, if everyone did consistency all the time, we wouldn't see dramatic innovation in interfaces. So it's, you know, we're not gonna focus on this one too much. Basically, it's really useful, and you can guarantee that users are gonna understand your application if you focus on consistency, but it's not the only way. So the second one is affordances. Let's go back to the test chamber, and let's say one day they encounter this, and they've never seen it before, and they're thinking, whoa, that's really interesting. This might actually be a way out of the test chamber. And uh, then, you know, how are they gonna figure that out? That everything about this design is designed to convey what it does. The way that the door is recessed from the frame, the curvature of the handle, um, the way that you can kind of just imagine that handle rocking in. Um, you might not know, like, on which side of the door it's gonna open, um, and you might not know what the words mean, um, but the picture sure looks like yourself, and it seems to be going through it. Um, but that's, that's sort of cheating. Just the, the physical design of this has been ca very carefully crafted so that when you look at it, you understand what it's gonna do. You understand that you need to push on it. And this is a type of thing that we do just throughout the day, constantly, uh, where you, know, you encounter stuff and you have to look down and say, oh, I'm gonna push on that. Uh, it's just this kind of thing that cognitively you're just constantly doing without really even thinking about it. Um, and that's called an affordance. And it's not just in the real world, but also in the physical world. All of these various widgets have these physical properties that are baked into their visual design. When you look at one of these, you can very quickly infer how you're going to interact with it because of those properties. Uh, the way that the, the circle is slightly larger makes it seem grabbable. The way that it's brighter on one side implies that it's been sort of filled, so it feels like a track that you can sort of grab this thing and move it on. Uh, seeing a checkbox, um, a square in the presence of one that has a checkbox, is gonna convey that that one could also have a checkbox. Um, on and off, literally writing it on the switch is uh, you know, going you know, more towards the direction of being, you know, writing your manual on top of it, but the visual design conveys what it does. Uh, same with the button. So these are all affordances. Basically, an affordance is implied physics from the visual appearance. Moving on to the second one, or the, the third one, natural mapping. So let's run a, a quick experiment on the audience. Say we're looking at a stove. So the second dial, which burner does it control? And silence, you, you don't know because there's no way to figure it out. We could literally write the glyphs on top of it. That would help. But the thing is, you know, writing your manual directly on the product is cheating. Um, then, you know, what if it wears off? You know, it's definitely one way of doing it, but it's not a natural mapping. Uh, a better UI, and this is something that Alan Cooper likes to talk about, is if the dials were in the same configuration uh, as four things, then it just naturally affords uh, which burner they control. Uh, this is also always true of light switches. So light switches only are frustrating when they don't actually map in order to the lights in the room. And if they do map in order, you usually just flip the right one without even thinking about it. If they don't, then you start you know, randomly hitting them, try to figure it out, and getting frustrated. So this is a natural mapping. Another example, controls in a car. Um, I love this one because it's actually two, two natural mappings at the same time. Uh, the first is it's directly below the window. So it's a sort of natural orientation to where the window is. And also the four controls map to the four windows in the car. Uh, sometimes these are placed on the center console, which is really weird. Um, and that's less, you know, physical world. Uh, in terms of the virtual world, uh, we have things like this, where the full screen control has a natural mapping to the window becoming larger. It's placed on the edge. It, it seems to afford expanding. Um, in this case, the, the account selector has a mapping to the window, because the, the account controls the window as a whole, uh, not an individual tab. So that's natural mapping. Basically, natural mapping is correctly abstracted layout. Uh, but even better than natural mapping is direct manipulation. So especially in touch interfaces, um, you don't want to have abstraction if you don't need it. Uh, you don't necessarily need little close buttons on things because you're able to literally directly touch the interface, uh, whereas if, you know, in the world of mice and keyboards, you had to have this type of extraction, abstraction. So you know, for instance, closing an open application on Android, you're just swiping it away, just as you would get rid of something in the real world. Um, and that's a you know, consistent affordance throughout the platform. And uh, so going back to the stove example, what would direct manipulation of a stove burner look like? Uh, this is, of course, kind of, kind of curious because now the dial is the burner and it's gonna light on fire. Um, but you can imagine like maybe some kind of gesture where like, ah, you know, you create fire or you put it out, you know. Um, it'd be at least very exciting. Um, and you'd never be confused over which dial because you would have direct gestural control over the burner. 
So that's the, the fourth one, direct manipulation. Uh, no abstraction, you actually act on the objects themselves. And then the fifth one is metaphor. So a metaphor shows up a lot in application icons. Basically what you're trying to do is you're trying to bootstrap uh, off of something the user's seen, uh, either in the real world or in the sort of introductory phase of our crazy experiment. Um, so things like, you know, telephones, maps, you know, various real, real world objects helps kind of frame them uh, and you know, ground them in something in reality to explain what the application does. And you don't have to go too far with this. I mean, it's enough to just kind of give them the cue um, as opposed to having like, you know, stitching or something in your application, unless you want to do that because you think it looks nice. Uh, you don't have to be super literal, but uh, at least, you know, draw that kind of distinction of this is the object that I'm conveying to you. And it's not just application icons, um, but also it's sometimes more fundamental things. Like, you know, we're, we're just used to having a light source which is above us. Um, you know, the sun just shining in the sky all the time uh, and, and the way that conveys light. So when you see a button, that light source is conveying to you that this thing is uh, convex and you can make it concave. Uh, it looks like you can push it in. Um, so it's just that kind of quick interactive affordance that you're getting through your experience with the real world, through that sort of metaphor. Um, and also not just small widgets, but large ones. Um, you know, a tab, uh, if you have that sort of same curvature and angle, people are going to be immediately thinking of sort of physical folders they've seen in the real world. So major structural components are gonna be part of your interface as well. So metaphor is basically abstract consistency. So that was the, the five parts about making it self-describing. So let's move on to the next one, which is preventing errors. So the first one I wanna talk about is mode errors. Um, obviously engineering audience, so how many people think VI is better than Emacs? Actually not that many, all right. Emacs versus VI, better? Anyway, so VI has um, a tremendous number of mode errors. Uh, because you are in either insertion mode or command mode. And uh, I say it has the mode errors because you could blame the user. I mean, it is their job to maintain state in their head of what's going on. Um, but, you know, maybe they got an email or something. You know, things are distracting them. They're thinking about their day. And next thing you know, they're entering commands when they wanted to be entering text. Uh, it's a classic example of mode error. Uh, another example, you know, you're in your car, put the car in reverse, um, you know, check some messages, then floor it. You know, like you don't have that that mental state of what mode the car was in right then, or even just, you know, if your garage door is up or down, uh, the occasional mode error. Um, so to avoid these, you wanna make sure that your application doesn't have modes unless absolutely necessary. And if you do have a mode, um, there's a couple ways to fix it. Um, if you have a mode where the user is actually actively doing something, uh, it's considerably more useful. So like keyboard shortcuts, you have that muscle memory of sort of pushing the key in as you're in the, the command mode uh, once the keyboard uh, shortcut accelerator is invoked. Uh, so you're not gonna have mode errors because you're actively doing something. Uh, if you have a very strong visual change on the screen during a mode, yeah, you know, imagine you know, there was something obvious to indicate this was in uh, command mode, uh, that would help. But generally speaking, you wanna try to avoid modes as much as possible because otherwise you're gonna have mode errors. Next one, reasonably obvious data loss. Um, it's often the user's fault, but you wanna protect them from themselves. Um, Google Docs does a really good job with uh, preventing data loss where it's reasonably hard to lose data with Google Docs. You have to sort of type the most important thing in the world, pull the ethernet cable and knock the computer off a cliff like all in one gesture. And uh, it's hard. Uh, Android phones, also really useful. Um, where, you know, all the data on the phone is gonna be backed up into the cloud and secured in your account. So you're not gonna lose all of that really important information. So that's just some examples of uh, preventing data loss. Also really important as people move between devices to have access to information. Um, and those are major cases. Also, you have to worry about minor data loss, which is you did a change and you wanna undo it. It is really important to support undo across all the various actions in your application uh, to help prevent users from making these mistakes. So that covers preventing errors. Now finally, making users fast. Uh, this is, you know, obviously speed is something Google cares deeply about. Um, and it's not just true of how things operate, but also how the user operates. So the first thing I wanna talk about is visual hierarchy. Um, computer science obviously focuses a lot on trees, the various algorithms you can apply on trees and B trees and uh, red black trees and binary trees and all these various things and breadth first search versus depth first search. And actually, it doesn't just apply to computation. Like obviously if you're, if you're caching data, uh, you want data that users access the most to be higher in the, in the hierarchy. Uh, so you have, you know, least number of hops to get to it. Uh, very common thing with computing, but also in terms of the interface, in terms of the visual search that people are gonna do. So uh, Gmail is actually a really good example of this. Let's look at 
your average Gmail inbox, where first thing right off the bat, the first branch point is read versus unread. Now in this case, um, all the unread messages are grouped together, but you know, even if they were you know, kind of scattered, you can easily sort of visually select on how dark it is, and just immediately at a glance, just kind of parsing it, see, you know, immediately know which ones are read versus unread, versus some little tiny glyph that was indicating it. So that's the first branch point, which is a good one because it's one of the branch points that people often want to branch on, knowing if they're looking for something new that they thought might have come in versus something they know uh, hasn't come in. The, the next branch point in the visual hierarchy is author versus message. And this is achieved not through contrast, but through spacing. So because you have a lot of space here, it's really easy to look at you know, the author field versus the message field and have another branch point there. Then the final branch point is the subject versus the, the body of the message. And here this is less obvious because it's less important because we want to build that hierarchy. Um, but you can also quickly differentiate the subject line versus the body because of that visual difference in the hierarchy. So here it's just uh, spacing and contrast are being used to literally create this tree in terms of the order in which you're going to be able to scan stuff and how easy it is gonna be, you're going to be able to scan things. So if you know you're looking for an unread message from a particular person, you have two hops and you can get to it really fast. So that applies to the messages coming in. Uh, also in terms of the interface itself, you have visual hierarchy. Um, it's reasonably obvious looking at this um, what the most common control is. But uh, you know, just kind of dropping the color and the, the contrast a little bit, you know, let's overlay some user metrics. Um, I should note these are entirely fictional. Um, I just made them up. But you can imagine uh, user metrics look something like this, uh, where you see more common controls uh, like Compose being interacted with a lot and also their placement uh, reflecting that. Then least common things like more labels you know, rarely being interacted with. And uh, this type of user metric starts to sort of, you can almost sort of see it when it's not there uh, in terms of the spacing and the, the order and the visual dominance of various controls. Um, you know, on mobile as well, you, you want to have, you know, in primary UI, the controls that people are interacting with a lot. And then in secondary UI, the controls that they might occasionally interact with. So you can just pretty quickly look at these user metrics and create the visual hierarchy. But it's not just that. Also, from the visual hierarchy you create, uh, you can actually kind of create the user metrics, because people are going to use stuff more if they find it. Um, so it's really kind of circular, um, where you're both designing it and influencing them and their usage, and then their usage is influencing you as a designer in terms of how you want to like, expose stuff. So it's not purely like you could just have an algorithm that's just going to like feed the data in and stuff gets bigger, because um, you can actually influence the data itself. So diving into a couple other things, uh, if it's law, Basically, this is solving for time given target size and distance. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, you have your target time, you have your distance. Uh, device speed is like mouse speed, or if it's a touch interface, literally the speed of the person's arm. Device lag is if there's you know, any number of milliseconds to actually process the event. Based off of this, you can you know, find out the larger things that are closer, you can click on faster, which is pretty obvious. Uh, Hicks law is more interesting. It's about solving for time based off of the number of choices and probability. So this is actually, um, you know, it's been proven that if you simplify the UI, people are going to be able to click on things faster. So the argument of, well, why don't we just inter introduce a button for that? It's because it has cost. Like, it literally makes the interface less efficient if people have to search against it. So um, equation here, you have uh, the number of equally probable choices, which, first of all, no interface is going to have equal probabilities. So this form's bad. Um, what you actually want is uh, summation with the probability of each one individually. And based off of that, you can determine um, when you have something lined up with others, what the access time is going to be as people try to locate the one that they're looking for and choose. So the combination of things like Fitz's law and Hicks' law uh, goes into the field of cognitive modeling. And basically what this is, is predicting a performance assuming highly trained users. So uh, unlike the self-describing section here, uh, you're assuming that people know what everything is. Um, and it's purely about access time and how quickly they can, they can target the control and get to it. Uh, so a lot of this work is actually done um, at NASA Ames. There's a really good group doing it uh, right next to the Google campus. And um, they're primarily doing it for fighter pilots, actually. Um, this is a simulator of the F-35. And in this case, you obviously have really highly trained uh, users because they know what every control does. And it's purely about visual access time and con small controls and proximity to other small controls. Um, but even for a standard interface, you know, a mobile application or a, a desktop application, you could do this type of modeling to try to make sure things are super efficient looking at the metrics. So that's how to build great interfaces. But um, you know, the things we talked about, self-describing, uh, basically you know, the user building a mental model uh, and sort of simulating in their head how stuff works, uh, preventing errors, making users fast, the idea of cognitive modeling. Um, 
but you know, that, that's how to make something really easy to use. Uh, to show an example, you know, this is really easy to use. Um, if you know you have to get to the other side, you know, we talked about doors a bit, uh, you know how to get there. Um, you can assume the thing rotates being inside a circle. Uh, there's no mode errors, because it only rotates in one direction. Um, and, you know, it's easy to use. It, it also, it looks like a human cheese slicer. Um, <laughs> it is not a happy door. Uh, so that leads us to the second part, which is visual design. Here's Christian Robinson. So not, not to contradict you, but I, I think that the, the design of that is actually really quite appropriate. It, it communicates perfectly, don't even think about going in me backwards. I will hurt you, mess you up. So, so Alex started out talking about users and how we, we can't blame users because it's not the stupid users. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to argue that, that users, in fact, are, are very smart. Um, it's, it's actually a hard problem to design a system that people can't figure out. Um, even think about things like, like cryptography or, or DRM or even code obfuscation, where, where as, as it, it, it's, it's difficult to create something that people can't reverse engineer. Um, so if this is also true of UIs, then why are we here talking about making things easier? So, uh, the reality is that people just don't care that much. If, if, uh, if they care enough, they can figure things out. But in reality, they have a lot of things competing for their attention, uh, whether it's all of the other apps in the App Store, all of the other sites that are going on, all of the TV shows, the watching Game of Thrones, the Bachelorette, both, and comparing, I don't know. Um, so so if, if something is really easy to use and people don't care, then it doesn't matter. So my argument is, if we do things to help people to care more, move over to the right, then even things that are very difficult, like learning how to drive a car, people are going to do it. Um, things that are really difficult, like riding a unicycle, and I know that some people care a lot about this, but in my case, I haven't cared enough to learn how to, to use it yet. Um, or something that's both easy and I care a lot about, like eating a sandwich. It's going to happen all the time. So. Uh, So the tricky part about this is that a, a, a good portion of these decisions that we make as what we're going to care about, what we don't care about, actually happen a lot below the conscious level. And, and this, this plays out in the, in the kind of research that we do. It, it's actually pretty hard to find out what, what people care about. And if you ask them questions like, well, why do you like that? Or, or, or even, what do you like? People are really bad at giving answers. You get kind of garbage data back, because we're not very good at even introspecting and knowing uh, knowing these things. So as designers, our job is to understand this and, uh, and help, people to, uh, help people to make choices. Now, there, there's a lot that happens in this process um, from when something hits our eyeballs to when it, um, for, for the small percentage that, that hits the top of our, reaches the top of our brains. So you, you may have had this experience in, in elementary school where the teacher told you that the eyes are not, in fact, at the top of the head that the eyes are in the center of the head, and there was probably people in your class that argued, or in my case, I remember thinking, being the artist in the class, thinking that my, my eyes had betrayed me, or, or, or how could I have not seen this? It's so clear once you, you, know, you get the ruler out. And as, as it works out, there's, there's a, a special unit of processing in our brain for facial recognition, and, and this, this is speculation on my part. But I, I think it's probably less important, the, the, the information from the eyebrows to the top of the head. Uh, and, and so our, our brain just kind of squishes it. And what, we're, what we think we're seeing isn't really what we're seeing. Um, this, this idea that... that that design and, and, and these ideas of perception happen below, the, below consciousness aren't, aren't new. In fact, uh, there, there are many people that have made this, made this point that sometimes the best design is invisible design. It's a, a very famous essay on typography, famous for, the, for those of us who are really into typography. So like, <laughs> famous for a, for a small subset. Uh, uh, where where uh, Beatrice Ward makes a case that, that uh, good typography should be like a crystal goblet that's, that's transparent, that you can't see it. You, you see the content inside, um, but, but the glass is doing its job best when, when, it's, when it's almost not there. 
Uh, so a, a bunch of psychologists at the beginning of, of the last century, see a lot of people doing this, recognizing a failure in my position of the text there. Uh, a, a, a bunch of scientists at the beginning of the last century uh, wanted to figure this out. There were a bunch of Germans. They wanted to figure out how to order things and group things and, and how, we, how we do that. They called this idea of order, they, they considered it order or rightness. They called it gestalt. Um, now here's, here's an example of, of some gestalt principles at work. Um, you can see here how some very simple changes in the structure of the data make it so much easier to process on the right. Um, Alex talked about these hierarchies of information and how since we can't change the algorithms in people's brains, we have to speed things up by, by structuring the data. Well, these gestalt principles are how we structure the data. Now, I'm not gonna go through all of the principles here. I'd recommend that you read the Wikipedia article on the topic, it's great. I could have just read it and done well. Um, but uh, but I've, I've distilled some of these ideas into two practical uh, principles that you can put to work immediately when you're evaluating designs. Here's the first one. This is the thing that I wish that people had told me on the very first day of design school. It's, it's line stuff up, that's it. Uh, everything should be lined up with something unless it has a good reason not to. So even, even if elements are at the very opposite sides of the screen and they're almost aligned, line them up. If we don't do it, then our subconscious brains are, are spending precious cycles trying to figure out, why are those things not lined up? Does it mean something? Does it not mean something? It's almost like I'd, I'd compare it to a, a memory leak in your software where you know, something's going on, you're not exactly sure, but, uh, but you're, 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 you're wasting your resources. Um, let's line that back up. That's better. So even stuff that isn't on the same screen, let's say three or four screens later, you've got something that's, you know, maybe in this case a little bit above halfway down the page. Line it up. Even though it doesn't seem like people will be able to make that association, and consciously they certainly won't, uh, our, our visual processing systems are using that information to know how to decode this. Uh, now, I, I might also point out, if you do want to bring emphasis to something, then not lining it up is a really great way to do it. You can see in these, these uh, suggested paragraphs right here how just pulling, the, the, pulling one line out of alignment gives you a bunch of information about what's the most important in a, a lot of structure. Okay, here's, here's the second big idea. Design the spaces. Now, this is a little bit hard to do because, again, our conscious brain is really good at, at examining objects in, in the foreground. Um, backgrounds tend to be less important than we, once we've actually picked out the objects. Um, but if we're designing the experience, it's important for us to, to, uh, to help people do that, pick out, pick out the groups in the foreground. One of the ways we do that is by looking at the spaces in between things. Our subconscious brains are constantly parsing our field of view, looking at the spaces between things, and when things are the same, have the same amount of space between them, we very easily and very quickly just rest. We check that off. Those things are grouped together. Those things uh, make sense. In, in, in the case where every element on the screen has slightly different spacing, again, our subconscious brains are wasting cycles. We're, we're, in our massively parallel processing brain, there's you know, billions of threads that are just in infinite loops um, trying to figure out what's going on, and in, in the best case, maybe we'll, we'll still be able to parse it. In the worst case, we'll just kind of discount it as noise, and we won't understand the intended structure. So design the spaces. Likewise, uh, using, space is a, is, using bigger spaces is a great way to, to break things up. You could talk about white space, but. So this is, this is especially true in typography. Um, this, is, uh, this is kind of a typographer's curse. Once you see kerning, you kind of can't unsee it, and you'll constantly be looking at, you know, every time you see a V and an A, you're like, did they kern that? Did they kern? Um, the idea is uh, letters don't, just the squares that the letters are drawn in don't naturally fit together, so you have to sometimes push them together, spend, in the case of type designers, spend many hours looking at all of the possi possible combinations and, and straightening them out. 
Okay, so the very last Gestalt principle uh, is, is, says something like, people can also order things by, based on past experience, which is a, a very short way of kind of discounting the whole rest of design. And it turns out that this is really one of the biggest and hardest parts. All of style and culture and all of these things fit in this very last principle. Um, if you look at this right here, you can see some of these, you know, these spacing and grouping principles it can help me to, to understand, you know, maybe make this, this number easier to parse. But if you've ever called somebody in the US or looked up something in, a, um, in an address book, you know immediately that this is a format for a phone number. Right? It's not because of, the, because of the spacing, it's because of these kind of learned ideas. We have a lot of these, and, and they're hard to deal with because, because they're, they're kind of vague. They're not, they're, they're, they're not uh, the associations aren't super crisp always. And here's an example of that. Let's, let's consider for a moment a, a, a grocer that wants to communicate to everybody that her produce is extremely fresh. And wanting to put her best foot forward, she commissions a sign, and she hires a, an expensive designer, and they make it out of chrome and, and neon, and, and she thinks, good, now people will always know that the produce here is fresh. Now, contrast that with a grocer ac across the street who doesn't really think about it too much, but all of her, her produce that comes fresh from the farm, just like the one across the street, comes in these, in these cardboard boxes. She cuts out pieces of the boxes and just scrawls fresh peaches on. Now, which of these two design systems conveys fresh peaches? Right? This is, this is, this is, the, this is a good example of, of the idea that better isn't always better. That when you're communicating something that these vague associations um, that, that people have can, can be a, a, a very strong cue. And so as product designers, we always have to be asking this question, what associations are people gonna make from what they're looking at here? Which is, it, sometimes it seems absurd looking at you know, a, a, a simple web form thinking, what associations are people gonna make with this thing? What does this look like? So we, in, in, in these design processes, we, this is one exercise that we do, and I'd, I would highly recommend it. It's not, it's not hard to get started. Um, just pull up a whole bunch of imagery and start sorting out on the table. Make, start making these associations. What, what should our product feel like? What does our product feel like right now? What do our competitors' products look like? What, 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 what things do we need to, what associations do we need to evoke in the minds of our, of our users? Okay, so now we're talking about how to make people care. There's one, one last idea I wanna put out there. One of the best ways to make people care about what we're about our products is to show people that we care about our products. Now, this is a, a reality about perception um, that's hardwired into our brains that sometimes very small things can make a really big difference in how we see something. Now, I I don't know whether um, whether if, if I if I download an app that has a, a, a poorly executed app icon, whether it's gonna be more flaky, or whether it's gonna crash on me, I haven't, I haven't necessarily seen the data with that correlation, but I do know that that's the association that users are gonna make based on millions of years of evolution. When you see something that's not quite the right color or that has a hole in the wrong place, you bite that fruit, you might, have a, you might be seeing the second half of a worm. So also, we need to not miss the opportunities to do the things that we don't have to. Um, those little pieces of design in places that, where they're not needed, where they're uncalled for, tell the user that, hey, a designer was here. Somebody, somebody thought about this. They're like little, little love notes for our users. It's, it's, the, it's like the interactive doodle on the homepage or the mint on the pillow, the, the, uh, what, what you put on the back of the box and the package. Um, it's, it's the, 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 the hidden extra level in a game. There's, there's, there's value in doing these things that, have, that don't have an apparent commercial purpose where, where we're showing people that we care, that they'll care enough to use our products. Um, in this case, Pac-Man didn't help people to finish their searches faster. It probably actually got in the way for some people, me included. Um, but people loved it, and why? Because we didn't have to do it. Um, it's like a note or flowers. It's these intangibles that show people that we care. Here's another small example that comes from Google Now. 
um, where the context header changes based on your time of day or your location. And when we were making these, uh, people asked, uh, you know, in, during the process, people said, well, this is, this is gonna be hard. We're gonna have to, we're gonna have to a draw a lot of cities and we're gonna have to draw a lot of states. <laughs> so it, that, that's, that's, that's kind of difficult. And the answer was yes. That's the point. <laughs> That it's, it's, these little, it's these little pieces and these little touches that don't necessarily have a, a practical purpose that demonstrate to people that, hey, if they thought that much about this, then think about how much work they put into the actual search results. Um, now, it's just, you have to be careful with this because it's a very, very strong message to send. You have to make sure that your product backs it up. So how, how do we apply this to thinking to products? Well, it doesn't have to be the, the, the large things. Um, the the, the Pac-Man example, for it wasn't a, the effort to actually make the game was a lot smaller than to produce the search results. Um, but simply ask yourself this question, what are the things that I can do that I don't have to? Um, so that's it. Um, here's, here's a couple uh, uh, pieces of, of reading that we recommend that you uh, look into to uh, find out more about some of these topics, like uh, affordances and natural mapping in Don's Nor Nor Don Norman's book, or the mental models in Alan Cooper's classic about face. Um, and for typography and layout, one of my favorites is the, the elements of typographic style. Tomorrow, uh, th there are a number of design sessions um, uh, relating to uh, Android development, um, so take advantage of those. And uh, yeah, I think we'll let's move on to questions. Also, there's questions. Um, yeah. Ed, thank you. <laughs> And uh, it was supposed to be on the slide, but uh, tomorrow at uh, 5.30 p.m. at the W Hotel in the living room, uh, we're gonna be having drinks uh, with the Android design team. Uh, so if you guys wanna stop by, it should be a lot of fun. Uh, and we're really eager to take your questions. We've got quite a bit of time, so go ahead. Um, I don't actually have a question. I just wanna say that was the best presentation I've had since I've been here, so thank you guys. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, I have a question about lining stuff up. So in Android, I will try to put an image next to a text view, and then there will be this little bit of space from the top of the text view until the text actually showed up. So it does not line up. The top of the image does not line up with my text, and it bothers me. I don't know, do I, I try to fix, fix it, but there doesn't seem to be a way to fix it. Should I even try? Like, it, yes. It is please, good that you're trying. Please it bothers try. us too. <laughs> yeah, we, try. We, 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 uh, yeah, that's, that's actually something that, that, that is, um, I'm reminded again and again that that's a little bit difficult right now because the, 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 the reality is that the, the, the top of the text as we perceive it is the top of the caps is usually the place where we want to measure from. And in this case, the, in, uh, in, in a lot of systems, it measures from the, the clipping bounds. So measuring from the very top of the text, if you're, if you're building these kinds of systems, is measuring from the cap height and the baseline is, is kind of where you want to measure from. So you may have to do some kind of, people always hate negative margins, or I, I don't know how yeah, to technically achieve it, but. I, yeah. I, I mean, I guess it's the next question. If I decided to do it, how do I figure out like, you know, what is the amount to shift for my font? Like, is there a computational way to do it? I don't want to just like try an error. It's like, ooh, one pixel, two pixel. Like, do it until it, it lines up. Yeah, um, we, we can talk a little bit after. I, sure. I, I can, it's, it's, it's an important limitation. We, the okay. M height times but, 0.23, I think. Yes, but, but thank you okay, for yeah, trying. I, I can talk. Yeah, that's great. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is something I've been really curious ever since uh, Google started rolling out the new design, because in Android, the basic theme is always like black, the background, whereas iPhone is always like white. So I'm wondering if you can speak to that or why you guys decide that kind of design. Uh, I mean, there's a few functional things. Uh, the OLED screens uh, consume less power when they're not illuminating. Um, also, they're occasionally very bright, so you don't want to just you know, burn the retinas of the, the user. Uh, those are very sort of literal things. Uh, Christian, speak to the yeah, but particularly static. particularly um, when we first launched Nexus One, the, the OLED screen on the device is amazing, and, and a lot of, some of these design decisions were made based on that. 
Yeah. Right, so you talked a, a little bit about how, you know, people have assumptions that they've made based on the wor a world, you know, that we've, we've all got and how that's not always that important. Um, and like a good example of that is that designers, I think, you know, try and do a lot with color where green is a positive action and red is generally, you know, error, warning, whatever. And so, you know, like in Gmail, the compose mail button is like a bright orange red. And I've always wondered like, what is some of the thinking, you know, I don't know if you guys worked on that, but what is the thinking that makes you kind of break that really, really firm color association model that most of us have? Yeah, so first I'll, I'll say that, um, that and I, I won't put words in your mouth, but, but <laughs> when we're, we're talking about the design process, it's, sometimes it's really important to, to kind of get those associations out of our mind to make sure that we can work on that more fundamental level, but those associations are extremely important. And so once we've kind of worked out, you know, how, to, how do we make it work without these kind of elements of, of style and trends and all that stuff, it, it is really important to layer that stuff back on to, to evaluate the work. Um, and in terms of the specific choice of that color, um, I, I, I can't speak to it, but, um, but except for the fact that, that red is, is a signal for look here. And that, I mean, so. Well, also, the, um, I didn't work on it either, so I don't want to put words in the mouth of the designers that did, but uh, one thing you can see from the design is that the colors, uh, they have you know, external consistency meanings, uh, but they also um, have really good internal consistency meanings, where blue is always uh, representing search, green is always representing share, and red is representing create. Um, and that's not the kind of thing that you have to actually know, or you know, on a, a conscious level know, but it's the kind of thing that, on a subconscious level, as you're, search, as you're trying to find the search button, or you want to quickly share something, you start to pick up those color associations as you're doing your targeting. Uh, so I thought that was a really nice touch that they did with the design. Great, thank you. Hey, uh, I work at a fairly large media company and uh, many projects I, I end up working on um, tend to have five or six design cooks in the kitchen and I'm, I'm primarily an engineer. Um, I was wondering if you had any suggestions on, on ways to influence the design um, when I see something bad or that I disagree with um, it, it, from that position? Uh, so the, the first thing is you want to always speak in terms of the user base as a whole. Um, if you immediately go in and say, I find this bad for my usage, uh, the designer is going to be like, I don't care. Like, you are statistically insignificant. <laughs> um, <laughs> even if what you're saying is identical to the mainstream use. It's just the phrasing, right? Um, so that's really key. Um, also, if you can back up uh, any of the things you find wrong with it with irrefutable principles, then you're actually having a debate on um, the, the actual design as opposed to opinions. Um, we don't see opinion debates uh, in engineering as much because you have these irrefutable principles like something shouldn't crash or it shouldn't use too much memory or it should be fast. So if you start grounding things in you know, mode errors or consistency or um, you know, any number of, you know, the user being able to find help if they need it, you know, things that uh, everyone agrees should be right, then um, it's not really a debate as much as you just pointing out a bug that they need to fix. Thank you. Uh, I've worked on projects with dedicated designers and then I've also worked on projects that are just a bunch of engineers making something that inevitably ends up looking horrible. Do you have any suggestions when you have just engineers working on a project and any things like that they could do to, when they know they're making something that's not well designed, what to do to help improve the design? Uh, well, uh, hiring an agency is, is always uh, an option. I mean, people often uh, discount that as uh, maybe it's going to be too expensive or they haven't done it before, so they, they haven't tried it. Um, it works really well. Uh, and also, you often see a lot of the return in having a really designed thing um, if you're selling you know, an application. Um, if you're just doing it yourself, um, trying to isolate your mind and look at it you know, from the perspective of a user. Um, if you, you know, are able to show it to other people that haven't seen it before and do sort of quick tests, uh, ask them to think out loud as they're interacting with it so you can kind of hear their thought process. Uh, sometimes everyone's so secretive about their stuff that you can't do that. Um, so that's really important. Um, do you have other suggestions? Yeah, so another thing that uh, it, for independent developers that don't have a, a very big staff is that for, for a lot of these platforms, there is a lot of work that's done into making the platform and making those pieces so that they um, so that they work and 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 do the right thing. So, looking looking at the platform itself and and kind of figuring out the standard way that the, plat the platform does things is a really good way to get, you know, oftentimes a good portion of the way there. Also, reading the style guide, I should mention that uh, Android has a great style guide um, that we both worked on. 
uh, so biased, but um, what's nice about it is it doesn't just give you um, the various principles, but also gives you kind of the thinking behind all of them. Uh, so, and it's not like a, a rule book as much as sort of guidelines, of, so you can understand this is why this will make your application better as you follow these various guide, it's guidelines. Kind of, so. It's kind of another instance of line stuff up. It's, <laughs> yeah. if, look, don't reinvent a new way to do a list and there's a, unless there's a really good reason to, right? And, and, unless, unless you have a, Unless, unless it really changes the character of your thing and, it, and there's, there's a purpose, you know, there's no, there's no reason to invent a new kind of scroll bar. Um, for the Android design style guideline, I was wondering what you guys foresee in terms of how that's gonna, uh, its evolution is gonna be over time, especially with like, you know, phone devices, mobile devices, the screen size is getting larger, and a lot of times I've, I've heard that you know you want to keep things close to your thumb, but with things like the action bar menu and overflow menu, it's so far away on a large device, you no longer really have the ability to easily do single hand actions. Yeah, well on large devices, you have sort of the radius of thumbs on the edges, so you want to definitely think about that. Um, and the style guides, it's you know evolving as fast as the ecosystem and the devices are. Um, we're constantly pushing out updates, uh, considering new patterns, things like that. So it's, it's not like this sort of fixed mm -hmm. uh, thing that everyone has to adhere to as much as a kind of, you know, organic living document uh, as we all collectively learned more, so. Thank you. Thank you for the phone number slide. I, I really like that. Uh, it reminded me of one of the horrible failures of iTunes that I've just been annoyed by. Uh, if you have a date and you format it with four numbers, a dash, two numbers, a dash, and two numbers more, that should be in ISO format for year, month, day, and no other order. If you're having sort of the other random orders that some locales like, then use the slashes or whatever is sort of standardized for that. And it helps users so much. Yeah, and especially thinking about your users, because you're gonna have your own date format that you're familiar with, but you yeah. know, knowing who you're designing for is incredibly important. I do, I do have a question this yeah. time. Uh, can you talk about tools a little bit? I know, I mean, Photoshop is the obvious one, but uh, what other tools can you talk about? Um, so I really like Fireworks. Um, it has more direct manipulation of the objects. Uh, you can actually do uh, nine slice symbols in it. Um, uh, a lot of people use OmniGraffle or Keynote. Um, we have stencils uh, for all of those, uh, or not Keynote, but uh, for OmniGraffle and Fireworks, we have stencils. We also have a Photoshop stencil for Android design. Um, it really, the, the granularity of your mockups uh, has a lot to do with um, how final you want people to think they are. So if you show someone a full fidelity mockup and ask their opinions, they're gonna start commenting on the colors and those types of aspects. If you show them a wireframe, they're gonna start commenting on the sort of organization of the information, um, you know, how you flow through the application. So it's important to create the mockup at the level of fidelity of the feedback that you want. Um, otherwise, uh, you know, really just sketching stuff on paper is uh, a very quick, fast way of you know, conveying ideas. It's, it's, early in the process, it's about how many different designs you can come up with, um, as opposed to uh, creating a perfect one. So that's also important to consider. A little bit taboo, but uh, a lot of us have um, apps that are on multiple platforms, like iOS as well. I just kind of wanted to see what your opinion or your comments you might have on, um, like where I work. Um, there's like a firm, you know, uh, to try to get it completely the same on both, and there's just a lot of you know directions that designers want to go to consistency versus um, for the platform. So just kind of want to see what your comments are there. Yeah. So this is a, this is yeah. one that, that comes up quite a bit um, for designers in this industry, and the I, the way that I think about it is um, from the product to designer's point of view, what they're what what we're dealing with is is all of these products across the different platforms. Right, and so, and so the first instinct is to design everything exactly the same because, and yes, it works the same across all the different platforms. But from the user's point of view, um, there are some users that have you know, three different phone platforms in their pocket at all time. That's uncommon. More, more often, users will have one phone platform and they're using all of these different parts of the platform. And so when, when they're looking for something to hang on to from a consistency standpoint, they're expecting things to work like the platform. And so, so when, when you uh, create an app that's consistent for you, but not consistent for your user, then, then you know, it, it, it's just maybe not making the right choice. So the designing for the specific platforms and designing for those conventions 
is, you know, it, it, it's a challenge to find a way to, to express your brand across all of those platforms, but, but I, that's well, the, the Also, right your brand should be stronger than just the UI. It's kind of silly if the UI is your brand. Like your brand is about the emotional connection people have to your application and your colors and wordmark and things like that. Um, and then also, uh, Christian concluded his talk with, you know, showing users that you care. Um, and also talking about how, you know, poorly designed icon does that application crash more. Um, your application, you could care a lot about it, but if it's identical to the other platforms, it kind of looks like it was quickly ported over. It doesn't convey that, that level of effort. Um, and people are gonna see that and make judgments off of you know, how much effort you put into it. It's kind of a negative note to end it on. Any other questions? <laughs> All right, well, thank you for coming.